Welcome everyone, everyone. It's my pleasure to be introducing this uh, first uh, lecture in memory of Professor Juno Han that are titled, What is a uh, Berkeley Engineer? And uh, as there was not a chance on Friday, uh, I'll, be I'll uh, take advantage of the, of, of the stage and say about a few words about Juno, my personal uh, memory. I've been very fortunate to have known uh, Junong as a teacher, as a colleague, and as a friend. As a teacher, I think I took every single class that he taught when I was here. Probably 224 is the only one that I skipped. I think he was a great teacher. Um, not those that uh, scream and jump, try to catch the attention, the attention of the students, like I do. He was very calm and quiet, but very patient. I remember he would put up a slide and then talk on it for hours. But you could see his passion. Right? It was really coming from, from, from the heart. He was really passionate about his topic. Sometimes I wonder, is it possible to be so passionate about waste? Like, look at waste, still, waste. Um, as a colleague, I've been collaborating with him for a while. And I sat in his group meeting for in a year and a half, last year and a half. And I think he was a great mentor for his students. He would listen to them, and then he would guide them through the process with his mathematical rigor that was typical, typical of him. It was a teaching moment for me all the time. Every single meeting, I really enjoyed those moments. And sometimes I sat there like, oh, I wish he were my advisor when I was a grad student. Well, two minutes after, it will be there blaming the student. You didn't do a good job. You didn't work hard enough. You were not rigorous enough in your approach. Well, that moment I thought, I'm glad I was not, I was not a student. And as a friend, I really enjoyed conversation with him. You could talk with him about anything. He was knowledgeable about it, just everything. And mostly, I really enjoyed his sense of humor that to me at the beginning came as a, as a surprise. But I really had a great sense of humor. So I had great memories of him, and I'll cherish them forever. But enough of me talking. Uh, let me introduce uh, today's speaker. It is uh, Dr. Aruko Wainwright. She received <coughs> a master in nuclear engineering and in statistics and a PhD in nuclear engineering here at Berkeley. She's now a scientist uh, at the uh, Lawrence Berkeley National uh, Lab. And uh, she will be talking about uh, uh, resilience. That was uh, one of the topics that was uh, very dear to Professor Ann in the last few years since its since publication. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for introduction. And thank you very much for having me here. Um, I guess this is the memorial series. I'd like to. Um, a few comments about Professor Ahn. I have so much memory. I worked with him a lot, and I learned him. I, I learned a lot from him. Um, the most, the biggest thing I learned is how to model very complex processes and particularly complex natural processes, and how to put them in numerical um, equations, and not garbage equations, beautiful equations, so that you can actually solve analytic areas. Well, it's not good at solving, but he could solve it. And, and he was also excellent at uh, building assumptions or defending assumptions. So now I work in Earth and environmental science area, might think it's totally different, but it's the same skills that I'm using right now. And I have brilliant colleagues in my lab, but many of them tend to rely too much on supercomputers, numerical methods, or big data analytics. And they, I see they get stuck often because time step got too small, or they're sometimes solving unrealistic situation. So um, I really appreciate the skills that I learned from 
complexer. Um, it's really broad, not just nuclear waste and other uh, many other applications. I believe. So here, I don't talk more. I don't talk about nuclear waste so much. I talk about more broader um, environmental issues related to nuclear energy. But you can see that how. I translate what I learned from Professor um, to much broader issues. So I work again in Earth and environmental science. It's a unique place that I'm working in nuclear related contamination, but at the same time, I work a lot in climate change science. So I go up in Alaska. <coughs> Um, looking at permafrost or watershed hydrology in Colorado, for example. And I see the urgency of climate change. It is really hurting the environment. So I, I think there is an urgency to expand nuclear energy. And that sort of alludes to the, my first slide. Um, environmental concerns are the biggest obstacle currently for nuclear energy. When you talk with anti-nuclear people, no one talks about efficiency or economy. Everybody talks about contamination, accidents, or Chernobyl. Um, you might think that, I, I agree that the concerns are sort of a little bit exaggerated, and you can dismiss that they're ignorant. But um, in my personal story, I grew up in Japan, my hometown was really close to nuclear facilities. We had two nuclear power plants, one interim storage, and one big reprocessing plant. So I was always scared of nuclear when I grew up. And that's why I learned nuclear. Now I have PhD in nuclear engineering. Um, and I still have some concerns, I would say. And we can talk about that in this presentation. So. What is the resiliency? I think people use resiliency a lot these days. If you Google, this is what you get. So in summary, resiliency is the ability to recover from disasters or misfortune or not, not being overwhelmed by those disasters. And do we have resiliency in nuclear energy? Do you know this picture? Yeah. So this is the Chernobyl after 30 years. It's still there like this. So oil industry have disasters often. Like there was a big one a few years ago uh, in Gulf. But they sort of managed to clean them up in a year or two. And then people just forget about it. But uh, for nuclear energy, I think this picture gives sort of the impression that there is no life after a nuclear accident. And I, of course, there is so much investment going into not having accident, but as you know, there is another one. So we can uh, think about Fukushima. I think I'll put this in a sort of the positive tone. So in Fukushima, after five years, their, um, the evacuation area is shrinking pretty fast. Um, there are new areas that identified to be released, or it's already, already happened in June. And number of evacuees have been decreasing steadily. If you look at the reports from Chernobyl, you find that they say that decontamination did not work in Chernobyl because people were not careful, so they recontaminated during decontamination. So in that sense, people in Fukushima have been very careful during decontamination, and decontamination has been very successful to minimize the area of um, off-site contamination. The big issue would be uh, the on-site issues. So I went to this site back in April. So uh, there is a 
there are many tanks that contain a lot of uh, contaminated water or there are so many waste. Yeah. These are boxes that contain waste. And in terms of groundwater contamination, they made ice wall, but it sort of failed. And the big issue is inside reactor, of course. So I guess you might think that, OK, contamination is elsewhere, Russia, Japan. But I would say that groundwater contamination is not so uncommon, I would say. Recently, people have found that more than 70% of nuclear power plants have soil and groundwater contamination. The main driver, main contaminant is usually tritium. Some sites have big tritium pollutant. Um, industry is aware of that problem. And when you have tritium, there is uh, other radionuclides too, like strontium and at this point, fortunately, this has not been a public health concern, but it's more like a public communication concern at this point. Um, so that contamination comes from usually buried pipes, because pipes get corroded over time, or spent nuclear fuel had some leak underground. And underground leaks are very hard to detect. So this problem become financial concern or financial issue during decommissioning. For example, at one site, um, Koneka Yanki, for example, has had spent like more than ten million dollars for remediation, basically removing the soil, and they measured that they the waste quantities increased more than expected. And it's hard to identify contamination where where they are because it's a lot heterogeneous. So uh, in this case, also I've heard that strontium is the main uh, driver uh, because the EPA standard of strontium is very low. And now we can look at the other side of nuclear and nuclear related to nuclear-related contamination. So as of 1995, um, there were more than 100 sites that were used for nuclear weapon production in the United States. And they were pretty much all contaminated. Um, do you know the biggest one in the United States? The biggest site? Yeah. Um, I was going to say Hanford. Yeah, that's the biggest one. The biggest one is the state of Washington. That but Hanford site was where Nagasaki plutonium was produced. But uh, during the Cold, Cold War, they wanted to have redundancy. So they made Sabana River site. That is the duplication of Hanford site. That's the plutonium production facility. And basically, they duplicated mess and contamination as well. Um, there are other facilities like uh, Colorado has a lot of uranium military sites or other assembly facilities. Um, Oak Ridge is the big one. Oak Ridge has um, serious mercury problem uh, used for lithium uh, production. And I've heard from my colleague that you can see elementary mercury shining in the ditch in Oakland National Lab. So it is a big problem. DOE has made significant pro progress to make, to recover from this um, problem. So that they have done a cleanup of the site, including tearing down the facilities, soil and water cleanup, and dealing with the high level radiant waste in the tanks. And the project did cost currently is more than $200 billion over seven years. So um, this is sort of the overview of what we have in terms of nuclear related contamination. So the big ones are nuclear power plant accidents and weapon productions. And the question is how we can fix this mess 
and how we can develop technologies or test, test sort of recovery technologies at these kind of contaminations so that we can improve uh, environmental resiliency of nuclear power, nuclear energy. Um, I quickly mention nuclear waste um, because nuclear waste is another issue when anti-nuclear people talk about nuclear energy. I would say that, so I work in near surface contamination, but the methodology to assess or predict is the same between near surface contamination and the deeper um, geological nuclear waste repository. We have to understand the geochemical behavior of radionuclides, or we have to model radionuclide migration and do risk assessment. So I believe that if we build confidence on modeling and the risk assessment in near surface contamination, I think that would lead to the confidence of modeling deeper nuclear waste site as well. <laughs> or opposite is sometimes true. I've seen some um, models fail at near surface contamination. So I think that modeling is still sort of under development to make it more um, reliable. So um, in the next 20 minutes, I would focus on more narrow issues. Um, I would focus on two sites that I'm working right now. One is Savannah River site and the other is Fukushima Prefecture. And I will talk about technical advances of, in terms of um, recovery. Savannah River site is, again, the former nuclear weapon production facility. It was built by the in 1950 after World War II. Um, it has five reactors, and this is the first place that had first full-scale operational purex process. So I guess if you took Professor Ang's class, I think you know, if you know purex process. Purex is the um, process to recover plutonium. And Sabana Riverside has produced one-third of weapon-grade plutonium in the US. They have 50 tanks. Different from Hanford site, they have not leaked yet because they made this site based on experience in experiences in Hanford. This site is still being used for MOX production facilities and tritium production facilities. Within this site, I work in one area. It's called F area. Uh, they dispose low-level radioactive solutions after purex process. And they just dump solution in the pond um, in 50s to 80s. So it's always weird or funny is that in 80s, people have already, people have started thinking about how to deal with nuclear waste. And Professor An and his advisor were calculating how much radionuclide going into the environment after 10,000 years. On the other hand, southern side, they were just dumping radionuclides at the surface. So now it is a problem. We have all kinds of radionuclides except for plutonium. Uranium and tritium are the biggest issues. And it's also, it's very, very acidic. So as you know, if you know chemistry, um, acidity makes uranium very mobile. So at this side, uranium spreads pretty quickly and the pH is still um, four or five. It's pretty acidic at this site. There have been remediation at this site. So they put caps, low permeability clay caps on the, over the basin in 80s. And this is typically the first thing they do. If you go to Fukushima on site, you see that all the surface is covered by concrete. It's the same thing. They don't want <coughs> rain into the ground, groundwater. So this 
cap prevent infiltration into the groundwater. And they also started pump and treat. So they pump groundwater downstream and they remove all the radionuclides except for tritium and they re inject and upgrade. So they thought that tritium would decay in between before going into this river. However, they didn't see such a big effect and it was costing $1 million per month. And they had a big issue with the waste. They didn't know what to do with filters, which could be considered as a high level radioactive waste. So the current direction of remediation here and all the other sites are called enhanced natural enhanced attenuation. So in this, at this site, they make barriers to rock groundwater and direct into the gate and they inject the base solution so that that would neutralize pH and immobilize uranium. So uranium will stay there so that we don't have to deal with waste. And we, there are different treatments being tested for different radionuclides. Technetium and iodine are big issues at many sites, Hamburg and Savannah too. And eventually, we want to transition to monitor natural attenuation. Um, so monitor natural attenuation means that we don't do anything <laughs> in terms of remediation. However, it requires long-term monitoring to ensure that concentration stays low and below regulatory standard. So the current approach is to correct groundwater samples and measure the concentration at laboratory. So someone has to go out to the field, collect samples at all the wells. It is a problem when you have so many wells like Savannah River site or Fukushima or Hanford. For example, at Hanford they were spending $10 million a year just for monitoring right now. So we want to have a better strategy for monitoring. So my colleague at Savannah Riverside was sitting with the data set. When you get stuck, it's usually good to go back to looking at the data set. The data set tells you many things. Uh, so she, she found that a lot of things are <coughs> correlated. For example, nitrate concentration is correlated with tritium concentration. Nitrate is correlated with uranium concentration. pH, of course, is correlated with uranium and water table as well. So because nitrate is a co-contaminant, because as you know, pure X process, you use nitric acid, right? Did you learn nitric acid? <laughs> yeah. So basically, they dump everything. So nitric acid is there. It's good because nitrate concentration we can measure by in situ sensor because it's equivalent to electrical conductivity at this site. So we have uh, in situ sensors um, that can measure different um, parameters like pH and electrical conductivity that are correlated with contaminant concentration. And we are living in 21st century, so we can get data right away, and we can send data over the phone network, and we can visualize the data set on the computer. And we can include backend processes like correlation with contaminant concentration as well. So in this way, we can know con contaminant concentration all the time without going out to the field. I guess we might have to calibrate from time to time, but the idea is that we can reduce the number of groundwater, uh, groundwater sampling. Also, it, it can be used to detect changes. For example, if the water table changes, that means there's a binary condition changes. So that might affect the contaminant concentration as well. So this is, we started to develop at this site since last year. So we have some preliminary results. We have a lot of historical data sets at this site. So for example, we can 
estimate tritium concentration <coughs> just with pH and electrical conductivity. And this is sort of the fitting between measured and estimated tritium concentration. Well, we still have big scatter, but um, currently the con concentration at this range. So we have seen pretty good performance at this point. Um, we are trying to improve this estimation and this monitoring approach. Um, I'm working with Francisca, Francisca, first year graduate student on data analytics. So again, we are living in 21st century. There are so many data analytics methods, including data mining and machine learning. So we picked one approach, common filter, which has been used to uh, control aircraft or robots. It's a very nice way to deal with noisy signals. And we haven't got the results yet, but what we envision is that when we have data from in-situ sensors <coughs> continuously, we can estimate contaminant concentration with limited number of groundwater sampling. So this is what we are working on right now. We are also trying to include different types of data sets. Um, our division have a lot of investment on subsurface characterization and capabilities mm -hmm. too. And we have fiber optics cable technologies so that we can put fiber up this cable. This this is same as like internet fiber optics cable too. And this fiber optics become distributed sensing of temperature, soil moisture, and chemistry. So you can tell where is contamination happening along this cable. In addition, we have um, a lot of expertise in geophysical imaging. For example, we have electrical resistivity tomography, so we can image subsurface in non-destructive manner so that, for example, we, we suspect that there are contamination, um, high conductivity vision around here. And we have started working with Kai's group, I guess Kai is not here, um, for mapping contamination near surface and surface because we have a lot of surface contamination near the river where, whether, where groundwater comes up to the surface. Uh, this, has, this monitoring technology has a lot of application, not just nuclear weapon sites, but other sites. For example, nuclear power plants. As I mentioned, there are a lot of sites that have tritium contamination or groundwater contamination. So we envision that we can install geophysical imaging and fiber optics cables, preferably when they construct nuclear problems, so that we can detect the leaks pretty quickly and we can respond <coughs> to fix the uh, leaks quickly. And I've heard that it's really hard to detect where is the leaks in the un underground pipes because the pressure in the pipes fluctuates so that you can detect the leaks with the pressure inside. And sometimes primary group breaks, I've heard, and sometimes they found uh, soil surface collapses because of the uh, contamination, that's what, that's sometimes, that, that's how they find big leaks. When I see this, I wonder if you might have a Schrodinger's cap kind of <coughs> problem here because you're drilling a horizontal hole which then has zero tortuosity for material to travel through. In other words, could your sensor be causing there to be a pathway that wasn't there before? Long transfer fiber optics. Um, well, we can, when we can put low permeability material around fiber optics. So that we can, it, fiber optics can be very completely under, in the soil. So we can put, yeah, low permeability material around fiber optics here. But, 
Okay, so yeah, so this way we can reduce the amount of plume, uh, sorry, the size of the plume, and we can risk, we can reduce the <coughs> risk concerns and also reduce the commissioning cost. So um, I'll talk a little bit about modeling of radio, radionuclide transport. I did a lot of modeling. I'd say now I have more faith in the data sets than modeling because I have seen, <laughs> I've seen more, a lot of models fail and modeling real geologic system is very hard. However, modeling is very important to understand system. And in this case, uh, we have sort of weakness. Enhanced attenuation is depending on the system understanding because we leave contaminants. So we have to have more confidence that contaminants will not move for a long time. And also, in situ monitoring is measuring proxy variables, not contaminant concentration directly. So we have to have more understanding and we have to have more long-term prediction. So DOE, um, Office of Environmental Management, has made a big investment on modeling capabilities. Uh, it's called ASCAM, Advanced Simulation Capability for Environmental Management. So they have developed new flow and transport simulator. It's called Amanzi, optimized for running supercomputers. And then the software includes other tools, tool sets like data management, parameter estimation, or uncertainty quantification. So for example, now we can model uh, the contaminant transport from the basin. So it goes down in the beta sun and the transport through the groundwater, and it, there are walls, but it kind of goes around the walls. So these walls are made for uranium, uranium plume and also for the base injection, but some people said that these walls could prevent tritium as well. So we tested it and we found that the barriers are not working for tritium because plume goes around the barriers. That might be the same uh, in Fukushima. That's why I, we suspect that Fukushima has also very permeable formation and they have barriers, but as long as they have some opening, crew can go around all the time. And we have uh, reactive transport capabilities. Radium has very complex geochemistry, including surface complexation, Kalino exchange, sorption. So uranium mobility really depends on pH. So we can have all the um, reaction now into the 3D code. Um, I would say that five years ago, everybody was modeling in 1D code. So this five year, we have made huge um, progress. And now we can simulate, for example, this is a low pH plume, acidic plume goes down, and uranium follows the acidic plume. And 2050, pH will be almost neutral, it washed away, but so that um, uranium becomes immobile and stay in the site. We can do uncertainty quantification, and we can use this modeling for long-term monitoring strategy. As I mentioned, for example, we are using the correlation between in-situ variables like electrical conductivity and contaminant concentrations like tritium. And we can run big model many times, Monte Carlo simulations, and we can simulate the correlation depending on different parameters. So, and we can do also sensitivity analysis too, and we found that precipitation and permeability is very important, for example. And precipitation will change in the future if there is a climate change or a hydrological shift. So we, we can say that we need periodic calibration of 
of this long-term monitoring strategy based on this modeling approach. So I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the end state of these rainy contaminated sites. What can we do about these contaminated sites very long term? So um, life after remediation. So this, um, I am the member of Sustainable Remediation Forum. That's the industry consortium that deals with all the contamination, contaminated sites, um, chemical plants, or DOE sites. And they have been working on sort of putting a more positive image at contaminated sites. So they have, for example, green remediation that can minimize greenhouse emissions that they use renewable energy for treatment that gives very sort of positive uplifting image. And they work hard on uh, developing sort of redevelopment plan. So for example, these sites have contamination, residual contamination underneath, but they can use it for solar farms or parks. So they can add values and they can add more positive image. So this is sort of the section summary um, of the nuclear weapon site. So um, there are some remediation methods developed, but the important thing is cost and waste. And there, so currently the direction is to have enhanced natural attenuation or monetary natural attenuation. To make this happen, to, we need cost-effective long-term monitoring strategies. And at LBL, we are developing EC2 monitoring technology with data analytics and sensors. And we think that modeling is very important for understanding the system and making this monitoring um, optimized. And I think the end state is really important. The image is really important. For example, I talk with people at Fukushima or other contaminated sites. They, oh, they say they don't talk about where they're from, or sometimes they are very discriminated from other people. So image is important, and putting sort of positive image up on the side is, I think, it's very important. So um, briefly, five minutes, I'll talk about our project in Fukushima. So last year, we have established collaboration with JAEA on Fukushima restoration project. So we have four components in LBL. Uh, we have flow and transport modeling of cesium in large scale, particularly focused on forested area. And we have mapping that I, I'm leading. And we have model data integration system. Kai is leading uh, 3D real-time gamma ray imaging as well. And I'll talk about this mapping component that I so as you know, mapping air dose rate or contamination is important for many applications, like estimating health or return of residents. Also, it's important for planning decontamination um, because the cleanup is still removing soil or leaves. It's pretty primitive, but, but if you overestimate the area, you have too much waste. That's also not good. Um, that's very cost and intensive. The challenge is that there are many different kinds of survey measurement. They have airborne survey, walk surveys, and car surveys. And they have very different footprints. Um, airborne survey, for example, is measuring gamma ray coming from a lot uh, bigger area than wall survey. And if you see the data value at the same location, they give you the different numbers. Um, we can compare walk, walk survey and air survey. So we're, this is comparing uh, walk and air survey in different um, land use type, urban area, club land, and forest. So blue dots are when we pick the 
same location. And you see that blue dots are so scattered from one to one line. And it's particularly scattered in urban area because urban area has higher heterogeneity and more hot and cold spots. And airborne data tend to overestimate air dose rate. And we can consider that airborne Airborne data is the average data, and we can take weighted average based on radi radiation transport simulations, and we can improve this correlation. These pink dots are based on averaging. And you can see still that uh, airborne data is overestimating air dose rate. So to put together all the data sets, we proposed a um, Bayesian geostatistical method that we have been using for other applications. So geostatistical method is basically how to interpret point measurements um, based on spatial correlation. It's been used for mapping cesium contamination at Long Island, for example. Bayesian estimation is how to put all the data sets in the framework. And it's very flexible, and it can include different averaging or different correlations. So here is some example, uh, sort of synthetic example. I have a true field, heterogeneous field, and black dots are the point measurements. And we have, uh, I have course data set mimicking air data. So based on these black dots and course data, we could we can reconstruct the true field much better than post data set. And we can estimate confidence intervals as well. So we have applied this methodology to the data sets in Fukushima last year. Um, so this is sort of original data sets putting together. I have able map and put walk and car survey data on top of airborne map. So you can see some of the uh, discrepancies because airborne data is usually overestimating air dose rate. And we can put the data together and this is the integrated map afterwards. So we don't, we have, we see less sort of discrepancy and so this is the, these black lines are the threshold of 20 millisievel per year and 50 millisievel per year. Because we can fix the this bias, the area over 2 millisievel per year has sort of decreased from over 300 kilometers square to 200 kilometers square, so more than 3%, 30% decrease. So, yeah, so this is sort of this short section. Um, contamination mapping is important for planning different activities, and we have created Bayesian geostatistical method to integrate all the data sets to reconcile this frequency and the integrated map corrected the overestimation of airborne data in a systematic manner. So um, this is sort of overall summary. So I believe that environmental technologies are critical for nuclear power. Uh, there are so many investments on not having access but accidents have happened and leaks are happening right now. So it's important to have technologies for after those leaks. Um, I would say over 50 years, uh, success is limited in terms of remediation technologies. Soil excavation is still a main remedy, especially for metal contamination and cost and waste is all, those two are always an issue. So it's really important to minimize the plume size so that leak detection is important and for existing contamination, <coughs> mapping and monitoring are very important. 
So for the long-term view of those contaminated sites, um, I think that enhanced, natu enhanced or natural attenuation based on um, immobilization is a good strategy as long as they don't compromise public health. Well, if, if there's a concern, they have to remove the contamination, but as long as it doesn't compromise public health, I think it's okay to leave it. And it's very cost effective, and it's no waste. It, you know, you don't, it's better to spend that same money on something better, I think. And for this um, enhanced or natural attenuation, monitoring is the key because we have to make sure that immobilized contaminants stay at the site or stay as we expected. And for this modeling, it's very important that can give system understanding and long-term prediction. Um, I don't work on this aspect, but it's very important to have sort of the end state strategies and attractive redevelopment plan for the contaminant sites. So, uh, five minutes before five o'clock. This is the end of the presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, did the tanks at Savannah River use the bubble wall design from after? Yeah, we'll start. Right. Okay. Yeah. We'll start. It, yeah, also, Hanford had connections between different tanks and sometimes the connection got stuck and that, that's where they, they have to fix. And Savannah has better strategy because they construct after that. So you pointed to something really important, which is the question of public health mm -hmm. and versus remediation. Could you could you talk a little bit about the water that's being stored at the Chinooshan site and its hazards and the decision about when and whether to, well, it will go into the ocean eventually, but, but the decision to put that water into the ocean? Right. I think it's a very um, difficult question because it's not public concern, but it's more public communication because you can, People don't know that nuclear power plants are constantly discharging treatment. Right? In terms of nuclear power plant contamination in the United States, they pump contaminated treatment and they can put discharge in the license pathway, for example. So, um, so I guess that in Japan, it's not there is no legal framework to deal with the contamination at this point. And it, I think it, in Japan, it's, things are more political and emotional. So I, I think it's very different from the United States. Sorry, it's not. No, I understand. Yeah. So because of the fact that they're focused on the water, mm -hmm. They're allowing corrosion of the containment vessels to contaminate it. And maybe it makes it difficult or impossible to ever remove the damaged fuel right. from the reactors. Right. Is there any logical way to explain this so that they could actually maybe do things that would be effective to remove that spent fuel? It's the most important long-term hazard. Right. I mean, to, it, again, it, I think it's very political. I mean, of course, it's better to discharge freedom to the ocean, right? That's the best strategy. And I think everybody knows that it's OK. But again, it's not OK for general public because it's very emotional issues for fishermen. So that, and then the, Ice will fail, ice will fail, and they they have so many problems. So I think it's very difficult. Sorry, I don't I don't have any good answer for that. Yeah, question. You 
showed some uh, figures from a THMC type of uh, reactive transport simulation. Uh, how long does it take to do these three D uh, plots? Um, and are they an overrepresentation of, of reality? It's still actually underrepresentation of reality because we are not having heterogeneity in subsurface. Uh, it runs less than a day using forty eight cores, so we can run hundreds or thousands of them in one day if we get the Q of the super. So last one, last question. So uh, you had mentioned before that a lot of people are concerned with uh, the safety um, of, say, nuclear plants. Um, do you have any comments about how you might talk to someone who is concerned about any contamination whatsoever? Talk to them about the like uh, about resiliency and dealing with contamination that's present in all energy generation. I think it's important <coughs> for um, those people to talk with existing contaminate, contaminated sites. For example, people are living there and they have their own way of sort of internalizing and they're fine with it. So, I, and then sort of having successful remediations and showing the successful examples, I think that's <coughs> one of the important things. Oh, yeah. You could say that things could go very wrong, but then you could fix it. There are technologies that you can fix it. Okay, thank you. I'll ask a last question. You mentioned at the beginning that, that there is an oil spill that gets cleaned up right away. Nuclear, it's not such a culture of cleaning up. What is the reason? Do you think there is private industry versus government, or there is something else in this um, I guess because nuclear, well, because nuclear, there, there, there has not been an accident, there was no technology that brought to the team and I question. So you think there is a technology gap? I think so. Let's thank again our speaker.